Hey, how's it going and welcome to another Fallout New Vegas weekend video. I hope you enjoy your stay. So, of course you can't talk about New Vegas without mentioning the four DLC packs. Dead Money, Honest Hearts, Old World Blues, Lonesome Road. I very vividly remember the releases of all these DLC and it, it was a very exciting time. Just wondering like, oh man, where is it going to take us? What kind of places are we going to see? What kind of characters are we going to meet? And how is it just going to expand upon Fallout New Vegas? And in a way, it's it's also weird for me to think that the DLC itself is going to be 10 years old soon too. Because I do think it is a very important part of kind of the overall picture of what Fallout New Vegas is and what it kind of means to me. Since the base game on its own, I would say that is, like, that is my favorite Western video game ever made. And so naturally, the DLC holds a very special place in my heart as well. But it's actually been about seven years since the last time I did, like, a, a royal flush, so to speak, of New Vegas, where I did the base game and all the DLC in one playthrough. And so it's been quite a while, so I, I obviously do remember pretty much everything that happens in the DLC, but it's been so long since I've went through the whole thing. And it's just interesting to think about how my opinions on them have kind of changed over the years. I don't feel like they've changed too much, but there's definitely some things I appreciate more, some things I like a little bit less, but yeah, I'm basically just going to be talking about all of the four, you know, the DLC expansion packs or whatever. Not really going to be talking about the Courier Stash or Gunrunner's Arsenal. That's kind of just weapons and items. I'm a lot more interested in, you know, settings, characters, storytelling, gameplay stuff. So yeah, let's get into it, starting with, of course, Dead Money. So Dead Money, I would say, is definitely the most interesting DLC. Not necessarily the best or the worst, but I feel like it's kind of hard to argue that it's not at least, like... The weird kind of sort of anomaly of these DLC. Just because it is so different from the rest of them. And if there's like one thing I could say about Dead Money is that I have a lot of respect for it for trying something so different. And just sticking to a kind of vision that some people really don't like, some people love it, but... It's unmistakably unique at the very least, so I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with the setup of Dead Money, but in case you aren't, basically the way it works is you and three other people have bomb collars attached to your heads, or your necks I guess I should say, and if one of them goes off, they all go off. And so it creates this very interesting sort of survival scenario that isn't really replicated in any other Fallout DLC or any of the games in general. And I just think that it's such a cool fucking idea. You know, this concept of like, okay, you and these other survivors, there's some madman controlling you. It's kind of like Saw, basically. There's this madman controlling you and you have to work together to, you know, accomplish the goals he set out for you. Or you all explode. However, this setup with the bomb caller is also probably the biggest source of frustration for just from the game in general. And this is kind of the make or break for whether or not you enjoy Dead Money, is how much you can tolerate the, the, the bomb collar, basically. Because just scattered throughout the different areas are these radios that, like, you have to do this combination of, like, almost kind of platforming, distance management, like, just going at a certain speed, trying to find the radios. And if you don't succeed, you blow up. And I remember back in the day, especially, that was the biggest source of frustration for me. I remember the first time going through this, it was on PlayStation 3, so that obviously didn't help. But it was just a fucking nightmare trying to, you know, just survive and like not... I remember there were many points throughout my first Dead Money playthrough where I was just like, should I just reload an old save and go back to the Mojave? Because man, was it annoying that first time. Now that I've gone through it, this is my third Dead Money playthrough. It's definitely not as bad as I remember. The absolute worst part of it is, like, the very end. But other than that, it's not so bad. I don't know if I was just impatient or if I didn't really understand exactly how the bomb collar worked, but I think that's what especially led to the kind of... This is the most common thing I feel like you would hear about Dead Money is... The storytelling and the writing and all the setting are all really good, but the gameplay is frustrating. And I would agree with that to a to an extent. I feel like it is a little bit overblown. I don't know how much of that is just people like not really understanding how it works or being impatient or what it is, but going back, it's really not as bad as my memory of it kind of led me to believe, but 
But I think what really makes it stand out and what makes it debatably for me maybe the best DLC, it, it's definitely a toss-up between this one and another one, is the, the combination of just the story, the setting, and the characters. And I feel like they're all so interwoven, it's hard for me to really pick, like, alright, which one should I talk about first? I guess I'll start with the setting. So, the Sierra Madre and kind of the surrounding areas is one of the most interesting just video game settings I feel like I've, I've ever experienced. Like, Fallout New Vegas is a game, if you watched my previous video, you heard me ramble about this for a while, but New Vegas is a game that lives and thrives off of its amazing setting and just well thought out, like, writing. And that absolutely carried over into Dead Money, which I would say the Sierra Madre is one of the best, just most well thought out settings and locations in the series. You know, as you learn more about the place, you learn more about just how fucking interesting it is. It's this casino fortress made with all of this insane, like, pre-war tech, which was kind of designed to be just like an everlasting shelter for this one particular person. And it's loaded to the brim with holograms, with interesting technology of, like, matter manipulation shit that lets you just turn ships into food and drugs and whatever else. And it's surrounded by this dense fog that has, you know, kept the place well maintained and free of corrosion. And so I would say for the setting, this is at the bare minimum, at least the second best, like just area that you're in. In terms of the design of the place, like, you know, fucking bomb collars notwithstanding, but just in terms of the design of the places, the kind of aesthetic of it, just the lore behind it, which I'll, I'll talk about that more later, but it's just such a cool fucking place. And that of course leads into the characters, and I would say... Dead Money definitely has one of the strongest casts of characters of all the DLC. Father Elijah is such a good fucking villain. I would say he is probably the best just like antagonist of the DLCs. He's this like renegade Brotherhood of Steel elder he, who you could learn about in like the base game. Veronica talked about him a lot. And there's such a mystique and a mystery to like what his plan actually is, what his motivations are, like what he wants with the Sierra Madre and you. And I think he's a really well-written character in terms of like being a guy who's objectively kind of fucking crazy, but doesn't really fall into a lot of like crazy character tropes, if that makes sense. You know, you listen to uh, like the radio broadcast that he's accidentally leaking out and you'll just hear him like mumbling and murmuring to himself about like, oh, why those, those colors go off? I said the frequency wasn't right. I don't get it. And so he's a really great, just mad scientist character who doesn't feel Feel like he's written to be crazy on purpose he just feels like a guy who's so weird and so out there but a lot of what he says still makes sense you know his motivations are understandable he wants to take the fucking sierra madre tech go back and take over the mojave and just build a new nation using it but it's just his obsession with it and his like paranoia about trusting people that makes him such an interesting guy. And then there's of course your other three companions, you know, Dean, I guess God and Dog are like kind of two different people, and then Christine, who are all really interesting characters in their own right. Like Dog and God are these uh, uh, schizophrenic or like multiple personality disorder nightkin who goes from this kind of stupid, like typical super mutant kind of guy to God who's this weird philosopher of sorts who's you know, way smarter than Dog. Dean Domino, who's a really interesting character from, like, pre-war. And then Christine, who... Christine is one of the most interesting, just like, okay, how do you make a character who can't fucking talk, communicate? Like, kinds of characters. There's just so much different little shit that you can extrapolate from her dialogue of, like, having different skill checks for certain things. You know, she tries to explain you something having to do with, you know, guns or repair or whatever, and you can figure out what she's trying to say. She does little hand gestures. It's, it's really interesting stuff. But it's a really great cast of different people who all have their different goals being forced to work together. And depending on the shit you say to them, your, like, relationship with them towards the end can either go really sour or end up pretty fine. And Dean Domino, this is something I never even realized, but Dean Domino is written in a really smart way to where you would figure naturally the way to make him like you is to pass the skill checks. But it turns out passing too many of his skill checks is what pisses him off. Because Dean Domino has this whole complex about like being inferior to other people. And so when you go and you show him up, he that's what makes him mad. And I never realized that because 
both of the times I had played it, he went, like, he turned into an enemy against me. And I never figured out, like, why. I always thought, oh, man, I was nice to him. I passed his skill checks. Like, what? what's the problem? It's like, that was the problem. <laughs> it's like, you, you made him think less of himself, and it pissed him off. But it really is just the interconnectivity of, like, how they all relate to either Elijah or the Sierra Madre or each other, that really is kind of the strength of the, like, the character relationships in Dead Money. Like, Dean Domino, you learn how to relationship with Sinclair, who's the guy who, like, owned the Sierra Madre. And him and Vera Keys had this plan to, like, fucking rob Sinclair, but it never ended up working out because he found out. And it's just really interesting shit to read about. I tend to like stories like that that are kind of, like, you have to go out of your way to figure out and, like, learn about what actually happened. And then there's, like, God and Dog, and their relationship with each other is really interesting. How Dog is basically kind of just a slave to Elijah because he wants, like, he just wants a master to serve. And then God, on the other hand, is like, yeah, fuck Elijah. And then there's Christine, who's a character that you learn a little bit about from Veronica, who is, like, Veronica's ex-girlfriend, and who's been chasing down Elijah ever since. And it's just really, it's really good, like character writing combined with the setting and the story of it all it's very well crafted that's how i would kind of describe it like that combined with the lore of just the sierra madre and how it came to be and dean domino's plot to like fuck over sinclair and really the only like particularly sour spot is like i said the somewhat frustrating moments that have to do with the fucking bomb callers and there's also just another couple of, like, obnoxious random spots, like the part where Dog is trying to fucking blow himself up, that part's kind of annoying. But really, it, none of it is as bad as my memory of it was. The last stretch is absolutely the worst, like, in the vault. That part sucks ass, because it's just like, it feels like it goes on for so long and you just hear beep, 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 beep all the fucking time. Yeah, the story of it is great, the characters are really, really good, the lore of it is awesome, and the only kind of sort of sour spot is, it is the kind of thing that, like, it's not the kind of gameplay I really want to experience super often, it's, I feel like there is a reason why I haven't played all the DLC in seven years. You know, you play Dead Money because the story and the setting and the characters are great. The gameplay is fine, but it's definitely, like, there are moments of frustration in it. So yeah, Dead Money, awesome. Very, very good. I enjoy it even more now. And then we have Honest Hearts, which I feel like it's pretty common to hear people say that Honest Hearts is like the most okay of the DLC. And that's a sentiment I absolutely agree with. You know, the first time I played through it, I remember thinking, eh, that was pretty okay. And now here I am, nearly 10 years later, I, I had finished it and I thought, yeah, that was okay. But I think, like, for me at least, the biggest problem with Honest Hearts is just the fact that there's really nothing about it that sticks out to me as being really, really good, right? Like, for Dead Money, I can sit there and say, yeah, the characters are great and, like, the setting is really good, the writing of it is awesome. But with Honest Hearts, I, I don't really feel like it has that really standout thing that's like, oh, this is amazing. Other than the, the obvious inclusion of the burn man so i feel like I, i'll just talk about him from the get-go but i feel like from like the initial onset this was very much advertised as being the dlc where you can meet the burn man and joshua graham the burn man the malpe legget he was a character that was very much talked about in you know the original fallout new vegas there's a lot of interesting lore and mystique around him of him being you know the original like military commander of the legion who is set on fire by caesar and rolled down the grand canyon and now he doesn't let anybody else talk about him and so it was interesting and it naturally made a lot of sense to build the dlc around the idea of you are going to meet the Birdman. and i feel like like almost to a fault joshua graham is the like the hook of honest hearts and it's really just an interesting character evolution, having him go from, you know, the general of the f of fucking Caesar's Legion committing all these atrocities, helping give rise to arguably the worst, like, military force that has been seen in, God, since the Enclave, I guess. And he's just a really interesting guy, you know, he has some cool dialogue, his philosophies on certain things are really interesting, his religious affiliation is neat, because, like, Religion isn't really something you see a whole lot of in Fallout, other than the occasional freakazoid religion like 
you know, the Unity from Fallout 1 or, like, the fucking Children of the Atom or something, but, you know, the Abrahamic kind of religions have pretty much died out. It's pretty uncommon for you to see somebody talk about, like, God in that sense, but it's just interesting kind of listening to him say stuff like, I, I remember at one point you asked him, like, so does the valley belong to the dead horses or something to that effect? And he goes, well, no, the valley belongs to God. And just those themes of, like, redemption of like and just themes of like how far gone do you have to be in order to be considered just completely irredeemable and how far does like forgiveness go in the world i guess but it's interesting to think about i feel like you know joshua graham the legate he's definitely a very good character he pretty much lived up to my expectations of what he would be like but unfortunately i feel like joshua graham a lot of the time that's where the conversation about honest hearts kind of ends because the whole rest of it is just, it just feels so aggressively okay the rest of the characters are fine like i think follows chalk is kind of cool the whole kind of tribal aesthetic of like this community of people that are kind of like far away from the rest of civilization is interesting. You know, Fallout's talk is cool, how he has an interest in, like, the rest of the world and civilization. He says kind of, like, funny, weird stuff sometimes. Waking Cloud is interesting. Daniel is, like, alright. Salt Upon Wounds is very- he's okay as an antagonist. He's more kind of just, like, a force of evil rather than, like, a fleshed-out person, but... You know, a lot of the people you came with in the Happy Trails caravan were like, they were interesting, but they just fucking die real quick. But there's definitely a strong contrast in terms of just, like, how interesting the characters are going from dead money to honest hearts. Like, you just heard me ramble about the fucking dead money characters for a while. And here I am, like, yeah, I don't know, follows chalk is cool. Um, and just the setting of Honest Hearts, I would say it's definitely the weakest of the settings. Like, Zion Canyon is- or Zion Valley, which one is it? Is it Valley or Canyon? It's Canyon. But yeah, Zion Canyon is fine. I feel like part of the problem is just that, like, it is different from the actual Mojave Wasteland, but not, like, a huge amount different. I feel like Zion Canyon is almost just, like, a place that you could just walk to in the Mojave Wasteland, you know? Like, if Zion Canyon was kind of just, like, this location to the far, like, the far northeast or whatever of the Mojave Wasteland, nobody would really put it aside as being weird, because it already is kind of a mountainous area. But I feel like there's really just not all that much in Zion to explore and find and really feel like, oh man, that's interesting. You know, it's mostly just like, oh yeah, here's a camp. Here's like a little trailer park area. Here's a cabin. That's a bridge. It's like, it definitely feels like a realistic, like, canyon parkland kind of place. But is it interesting? Like, not, not particularly. You know, going through it, it wasn't really the kind of place that I was, like, super thrilled to discover new things. Because most of the time, it was just like, Oh shit, it's a cave! Or, oh fuck, dude, this is like a cabin. I bet people stayed here at one point. Like, there's the occasional kind of interesting thing to find. But not really. <laughs> there's not a whole lot. But it's just very much okay. It's like... It's okay to the point where it almost pisses me off because it's like, there isn't even anything bad about it that I can really sit there and be like, oh yeah, this part of it sucks. It's like, it's all just really fine. But I had this thought after I finished it of just like, imagine Honest Hearts without the Burn Man. Would that not be the least interesting fucking DLC that you've ever gone through? Because like, you remove him from the equation and it really just feels so lacking in soul, I guess? Like... Joshua Graham really is the soul of Honest Hearts. He, he truly is the heart of Honest Hearts. And I feel like if you just remove him from the equation, like you replace the leader of the dead horses with some other guy, just stop and visualize what that would be like. It would not be particularly interesting at all. And so yeah, Honest Hearts, it's, it's just very fine. It's not something that I feel like I've wasted my time playing. It's not something where I'm like, oh, that's so fucking boring. It's not, it's just okay. You guys like quesadillas? I just ate one in between <laughs> recording the Honest Heart segment in this one, but. So Old World Blues was my favorite DLC. And spoiler warning, it still is. Um, 
Yeah, I fucking unabashedly love Old World Blues. And honestly, going back into it, I feel like my biggest fear was the idea that I wouldn't like Old World Blues as much as I remember. Because a big part of it is the humor and just like the comedy and the writing of it. And so my fear was kind of like, alright, it's been, you know, seven years since the last time I played it. Maybe I just won't find the shit funny, or I'll just find it kind of annoying. And if the writing goes, my fear was that, like, the whole rest of the experience would suck. And in the first couple of minutes of when I first got into it, of when I was talking to the different doctors, I feel like I was worried because I was like, oh man, this... It's not really doing it for me. But the longer it went on, and the more I was kind of, like, I kind of just allowed my brain to accept the insanity, the more I was like, all right, yeah, yeah, this is still really fucking funny and well-written. And you know, following with the theme of Dead Money and like the rest of New Vegas, what is good about Old World Blues is the writing and the dialogue and the characters, and also the setting as well. All of the different doctors in the game are so fucking funny. It's the kind of thing where like, you, you really do just want to sit there and just listen to them talk. Since it really does all just feel like one big fucking Futurama episode. It's like this magnificent fucked combination of, you know, a Futurama episode and like a, a 1950s or 60s sci-fi B-movie, but also in the Fallout universe. And obviously not every single bit of dialogue absolutely nails it and is like the funniest thing ever. But it's always at least entertaining. You can definitely tell the people who wrote it have had a massive amount of fun just like writing weird goofy shit. And that's another thing I really like about Old World Blues is just the fact that it's like, it's goofy and stupid and doesn't take itself too seriously. It's just fun. This was the fun DLC, right? You know, Dead Money is this like kind of depressing, anxiety inducing experience where you're in these like claustrophobic environments and it's a matter of survival. And Honest Hearts was about this like tribal warfare and the, the nature of redemption. Lonesome Road is also super serious. And then it's like, then there's fucking Old World Blues, which is just like, you can talk to your brain. And there's a giant dog who explodes into a nuke. And characters keep talking about how your toes look like penises. And there's just so much about it that I find so fucking entertaining. It's one of those things where like, after I had finished it, you know, I was browsing through the wiki just trying to think of different things to like bring up and I found myself getting distracted just reading all the different articles about like Old World Blues locations and characters and reading their quotes. But all the characters are great. Like, it's pretty much only the doctors like in the fucking brain things, which is another thing that's just so weird. Like, why would you put yourself in such an inconvenient housing device? Where you have fucking monitors, but no arms. It's really fucking strange and funny. Dr. Klein is really funny because he's so fucking pompous and like holier than thou. The way he treats the rest of the brains is really funny. Dr. Dalla is great. How weirdly obsessed with the human body she is. Dr. Boros is great. I love how he created Cazadors and he insists that like they have not escaped. But they have, like, you know, Dr. 8 just talks in, like, weird, random fucking static. But I think my favorite is actually Dr. O, who I actually learned, he's actually voiced by the same guy who does the voice of Dr. Venture in the Venture Brothers. So that's just a cool little detail, but yeah, he's my favorite of them. But yeah, just the dialogue of them all combined with the weird sci-fi shit that's going on. Like, it's so absurdist and so fucking out there that it almost loops back around and you stop caring about how fucking crazy it all is. You kind of just accept it as reality. And beyond that, Big Mountain itself is just such a fascinating environment. It's definitely my favorite setting of the four. Even though the Sierra Madre is really fucking good, I feel like I'm more attached to the Big Mountain. Because there's just so much weird shit to find and so many like interesting scientific locations. There's all these different research facilities. There's like botanical gardens, medical shit. <laughs> little concentration camps and just exploring it really fills you with this satisfying sense of like what weird fucking shit am i gonna find here today and also there's you know the sink there's all the different sink appliances which are i, I want to know what kind of fucking writing room meeting there was when they came up with the idea of okay talking appliances you know there's the two light switches who hate each other there's the fucking book shoot who's like always talking about communists and subversive material. The toaster who just wants to burn the world, muggy. It's all just great entertaining fun. And it's like, 
the actual story itself, it is a little goofy, but it is still good. You know, you get there and you find out your brain has been removed and also your heart and your spine. And there's a bunch of floating brains having a war against another brain who has robo-scorpions that drain intelligence. And eventually you find out that the evil doctor is actually probably the nicest and most sensible of them. And he tells you about how he on purpose fucked with their minds so that they think that the big empty is the world. And now he's just engaging in these petty feuds with them to keep them distracted for as long as possible so they don't escape out into the wider world. And it's just so fucking goofy, especially when you compare it to Dead Money, which is just miserable. This is just the goofy, whack-ass child of this DLC family. And I really, really love it for that. So yeah, Old World Blues, definitely my favorite of the DLC. I thoroughly enjoy my time with it. So now I want to talk about something that I didn't really want to bring up at the beginning, but it's something that I find very, very important to all the DLC and Fallout New Vegas itself. And it's just the interconnectivity between the base game and the DLC in terms of, like, stories and characters. It's one of those things where I kind of take a step back and look at all the different DLC, and I think that, like, the whole of all four of them is kind of greater than the sum of their individual parts. Because they all tell this ongoing interconnected story, primarily about, you know, Ulysses and the Courier... Because it all kind of goes full circle, no matter how long you, you stop to think about it. Like, Father Elijah is the villain of Dead Money, and you learn about him from Veronica. And you also learn that Veronica had an ex who was in the Brotherhood of Steel, and that's Christine. And Christine tracked down Father Elijah in some place called the Big Empty, or the Big Mountain. A place that's, I'm pretty positive, never spoken about in the Mojave. There might be some random stray bit of dialogue, or like a file somewhere about it, but... But yeah, you learn from Christine that her and Elijah and some courier were in some place called the Big Mountain. And then in Honest Hearts, you meet the Burn Man, who is of course a major background character in the base game. And he also talks about this mysterious courier. Then in Old World Blues, one of my favorite things about Old World Blues is actually finding all the random, you know, Father Elijah and Ulysses locations. Because there's quite a few different spots where you can find different shit that, like, Elijah was working on or places he was scouting out. And you learn this is where he figured out that all the, the Sierra Madre tech was being worked on here. And this is also where he figured out how to get the bomb collars working. And Ulysses went there in pursuit of knowledge and so did. And Christine went there to find Elijah. And Ulysses like nursed Christine back to health. And it's just the interconnected stories of it are so good because you can really play any of them in any order. You know, it was obviously designed to be played in release order of like Dead Money, then Honest Hearts and Old World Blues, then Lonesome Road. But you can kind of do whatever, and you can figure out things in whatever order you want, really. And that was part of the fun and the mystique of when the DLC were first coming out, is just all these little nuggets of information they would leave you. Especially when it came to Ulysses. So, I will go on record as saying, I feel as if the build-up to Ulysses was one of the greatest slow-burn kind of character reveals that I've ever personally experienced. Because even going back to the base game, Ulysses was a character, he was a scrapped companion who was meant to be kind of like the Legion representation for your companion roster. Because the base game is very, very sorely lacking on like sympathetic Legion characters that aren't, you know, working with the Legion directly. But you can just find all these tiny, tiny little nuggets of what was left of Ulysses, like he's one of the playing cards in the collector's edition, and he was spoken about a bit like from other different characters, like I think Johnson Nash is the one who tells you, yeah there was another courier but he saw your name and was like fuck this and let you take the platinum chip. But beyond that he really did feel like a scrapped character that just tiny little bits and pieces of him managed to survive. And that's kind of just what Ulysses was in the base game, he was just that scrapped Legion companion that you could kind of sort of learn about, but the, he was kind of a mystery. And he's built up more and more and more across the different DLC. Like, Dead Money, I think it's the first time he's mentioned by name. I might be wrong about that, but... You know, Christine talks about, oh yeah, there was a courier in the big mountain and he helped me and da da da. And then in Honest Hearts, you know, Joshua Graham's like, yeah, I was expecting a different courier to show up and fucking kill me. And then in Big Mountain, you learn that he talked to the think tank and he, whatever he told them, it fucked with their minds so bad they had to reset their memory back a couple days. And so the slow buildup leading to the, the eventual, you know, the DLC 
where fucking Ulysses finally shows up was great. It was I truly do believe it stands out as one of the best slow burn introductions of a character ever. And finally, I walk a lonely road on the boulevard of broken dreams. We come to Lonesome Road, the final DLC. And it was okay. It, it, it was alright overall. So I guess I'll start by talking about the setting of The Divide. The Divide is cool. I would say it, it's probably my second least favorite of the DLC locations. It's still neat. I find it at least more interesting than Zion, but... I think there's pretty cool lore to it. It's like this old military area that used to have a bunch of fucking nukes on it, and then all the nukes went off, and it completely destroyed the land, and now there's nothing left but former Legion and NCR soldiers who are skinned alive and turned into ghouls. And you know, this feels like a place that got fucking wrecked. Like, because of the lore of New Vegas, of how pretty much all the nukes were neutralized, there's not really a whole lot of areas that are just completely fuck annihilated in the Mojave. And that's also kind of the case for the rest of the DLC. Like, the Sierra Madre is obviously intact. Zion is pretty much untouched. Big Mountain is fine. But the Divide is cool. It is a bit linear. I feel like that's one of the more common complaints you hear about it. Because Zion and Big Mountain were totally open areas. The Sierra Madre is a little bit more like, okay, you're supposed to kind of go this way, but in general, you can still explore the area however you want, but the Divide is kind of just a straight shoot. There's obviously a few branching paths that lead to other locations, but it is pretty much designed to where you're going to go from point A to B to C to D. But I don't really mind it, because it is a cool area, and it is more about the, the story about you and Ulysses than it is you know, exploring this area necessarily, even if that is a big part of it. So yeah, the Divide is cool, and Lonesome Road is also known for its really fucking powerful enemies. Obviously, the lower level you're at, the easier it is. I got into Lonesome Road, I was like level 45 or so, and yeah, it's tough, especially those fucking Death Claws. So it really does feel like, okay, this is the endgame challenge DLC. This is the one that pushes you to the limits. It's also a fucking paradise of powerful ammunition. There's so much ammo everywhere, it's great. And then we come to Ulysses himself, and I'm very conflicted on how I feel about Ulysses just as a character. I'll definitely say that I feel as if the build-up for him definitely didn't meet my expectations. He's definitely very, very interesting. But I would kind of describe my problem with Ulysses as... He, he represents too many things at once, and none of them really feel super cohesive. Because I feel like you could ask, you know, 20 different people what, what Ulysses' philosophy was, and you would end up with 20 different answers, and I really don't feel as if it was, like, written that way on purpose. Because there's some characters where you can extrapolate a lot of different meaning from what they're saying or what their philosophy might be. But sometimes it's, it just feels like information overload. But it mostly just feels like a lot of philosophy that doesn't really lead to a conclusion. And maybe that was the point, but it's like... I listened to all of his different speeches and his recordings about, you know, symbols and history and names and tribes and Caesar's Legion and the NCR and Vegas and the Mojave and the Divide and the impact that one person can have. But at least for me, it never really feels like it reaches a conclusion, like a conclusion of thought. You know, to compare it to another character, uh, Caesar, right? Caesar has a lot of philosophies that are really fucking weird, but at least at the end of the day, I can sit there and say, this is what Caesar is about. He's about strength of rule, about order, about dominating opposition into submission, and he thinks that only through giving people a strong, unified identity can they survive in the wasteland. But with Ulysses, I kind of just think, like, uh, symbols are important. The NCR is flawed. One person can make a difference. The past happened, it's like, I don't know if it's just a lot of really simple but to the point philosophies that are really really overly wrapped up in this pretentious bullshit, but it just kind of makes me stop and wonder, like, what was, what did Ulysses really really think? Or what was the message he was trying to convey, I guess? You know, the point obviously isn't those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it, because he launches nukes, like, it's so, like, yeah, the old world was pretty fucked up, but I don't really see him providing any new solutions, right? 
So, I don't know, I, I feel like at the end of the day, Ulysses is more a character that kind of just confuses me more than anything. And it's not really from the point of me being too stupid to understand, or maybe it is, fuck, I don't know, maybe he's the deepest character ever written. I don't know, I just feel like there's so many more, just like, simple, more sensible things they could have kind of done with Ulysses. And maybe that was the point, maybe Ulysses is just meant to be this character who waxes poetic about different philosophies, it makes you kind of sort of think about random shit, but never really comes up with a, a conclusion. But I don't know, I still like him. I still think he's a really interesting character. I'm still definitely attached to the buildup that he had. I just feel like as the ultimate boss of the Fallout New Vegas DLC, he is kind of disappointing. Man, that wasn't even a discussion about Lonesome Road. That was just me talking about Ulysses, but yeah, they're all at least good. There's no DLC that I sit there and think that was bad. At the worst, they're very aggressively fine. So in order of my personal enjoyment of them, Old World Blues is definitely my favorite, then Dead Money, and then I would say probably Lonesome Road and uh, Honest Hearts are basically tied. I might like Lonesome Road a little bit more just because I find the environment more interesting, but I like them a comparable amount. So yeah, that has been today's Fallout New Vegas weekend video. I hope you all enjoyed. Tomorrow will be my Fallout New Vegas character tier list. Yeah, I'll see you guys next time.